Santa never brings me a banjo. I can never understand why. Every Christmas Eve I see it in my dreams, and every Christmas morning I cry. Santa never brings me a banjo. I can never understand why. Every Christmas Eve I see it in my dreams, and every Christmas morning I cry. Santa never brings me a banjo. I can never understand why. Every Christmas Eve I see it in my dreams, and every Christmas morning I cry. My brother got the train that he asked for. My sister even got a violin. How can he miss the one thing on my list in the letter that I sent to him? I told him how hard I would practice. Told him I would play so loud that I loan some sound to fill up the town, make my parents so proud. But Santa never brings me a banjo. I can never understand why. Every Christmas Eve I see it in my dreams, and every Christmas morning I cry. Santa never brings me a banjo. I can never understand why. Every Christmas Eve I see it in my dreams, and every Christmas morning I cry. brought me a banjo I couldn't believe my eyes for beneath the Christmas tree it was there for me and now it's my parents who cry yeah Santa finally brought me a banjo I couldn't believe my eyes for beneath the Christmas tree it was there for me now it's my parents who cry Solstice. Seasons greetings. And Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Blizzards. <laughs> Black ice. <laughs> Frigid winds. <laughs> Breakdowns. <laughs> Breakups. I didn't do it. You did too. Did not. Did too. And pandemics will not keep us from upholding tradition. Welcome to the Myrna Loy Soundstage Celtic Cowboy Christmas Concert of 2020. We're so glad that you're here. We're so glad that you're in the auditorium, and we're glad that you're streaming. We're going to play some of our favorite songs from the last 25 years. Hope you'll enjoy it. So on with the show. When Joseph was an old man, an old man was he, he, he Mary, Virgin Mary, Queen of Galilee, he, he, Mary, Virgin Mary, Queen of Galilee. Joseph and Mary walked through an orchard green, there were apples and cherries, the girls might be seen, there were apples and cherries. 
workers might be seen. Mary spoke to Joseph, so meek and so mild. Joseph, gather me some cherries, for I am with child. Joseph, gather me some cherries, for I am with child. Then Joseph flew in anger, in anger flew he. Let the father of the baby gather cherries for thee. Let the father of the baby gather cherries for thee. Up spoke baby Jesus from in Mary's womb. Bend down your tallest branches that my mother might have sung. I have cherries at command, said she, oh, look now, Joseph, I have cherries at command. Then Joseph went a-walking, he heard an angel sing, tonight shall be the birth time of Christ our heavenly King. Tonight shall be the birth time of Christ our heavenly King. Joseph was an old man, an old man was he, he Mary, Virgin Mary, Queen of Galilee, he Mary, Virgin Mary, Queen of Galilee. Hello, everybody. Good evening. I'm here with Jim Schultz of Dublin Gulch. We're here to talk about the Celtic Cowboy Christmas. Jim, welcome to the show. Tell me how this whole Celtic Cowboy Christmas thing got started. Well, thanks, John. Around 1995, I went to Bozeman, Montana to take in the Wyndham Hill Winter Solstice concert. And it's featured Phil Auberg, Daryl Anger, and Liz Story. Billy Oskey and Triona O'Donnell. They were part of a group called Night Noise, and it was a spectacular show. Every one of those artists had their own solo spot, but 
what really, really amazed me was the ensemble work. They had gotten together and they had chosen songs that really meant something. And it wasn't your standard Christmas fair. It was more of a um, deep winter changing of the light solstice event. And I was transfixed. And I thought, if I ever do a production, I want it to be like that. I want it to be unique. I want it to honor the, the ancient roots of this particular holiday season. And so oh, about two years later, I got a hold of my buddies, the Dublin Gulch guys, uh, Tom Powers, Kevin McGreevy, and Mick Cavanaugh. I wasn't part of the band at that point in time, but I would sit in and sing with them every once in a while. I asked them if they want to be part of this production, and they said, sure. And they brought a lengthy uh, set list of appropriate songs and tunes. And, and then I got a hold of uh, some real dear friends in town here, Terry Gunderson, Murphy Fox, Zoe Wood, Pat Acey, my bluegrass buddy from Bozeman, and someone that you know, um, your wife, Claire Pichette. She was just a teenager at that time. Claire was in the first show? She was in the first show, yes. She played guitar and sang backup. I knew she played with you, but I didn't know she was in the first yeah. one. You didn't tell me. You didn't tell me you were in the first one. <laughs> Claire. <laughs> <laughs> so that was late 90s? That was late 90s, 1997. Have you been doing it uninterrupted ever since? No, no. Oh. There have been interruptions, you know. So it, it goes maybe five or six shows, six years, and then we had time off. People have moved away. We've had kind of a revolving set of, of uh, personnel. Sean Logan, Randy Riemann, Bruce Anfitson, Chris Holmes joins no. us. Yeah, Chris Holmes joins us and managed to get Wilson and McKee from Polson in 2001 to be part of it. And they're still part of it. So it's Dublin Gulch. They're sort of like the anchors, Dublin Gulch and then Wilson McKee. But they moved away. They moved to Colorado. So um, there have been gaps. How do you know uh, Wilson and McKee? I met Wilson and McKee in 1995 uh, on Tom May's River City Folk Show. Tom May was a musician and he, to this day he still has this interview show. And he happened to have a um, traveling show and he came to the Myrna Loy. He showcases several albums that come out. Uh, my album, uh, Where the Red Wing Blackbird Sings, had uh, debuted in 1995. Their album, um, The Pattern, had debuted. And then Bruce Amphitson had an album out at that time too. So the, we were the three guests and I met Wilson and McKee and we hit it off immediately. They have a they have this sense of humor and the musical adventure is, is like-minded. We started in Butte, and we would come to Helena, and then from there we would go to various other places. We've done, we've gone on tour, kind of, you know, a, like a three-week tour, and we would go to Polson and Big Fork and Kalispell and Hamilton, right. Phillipsburg, Deer Lodge. You're a Deer Lodge boy. I'm a Drummond boy. Drummond boy. It's, it's only, it's only, you know, it. 38 miles away. Yeah. So that's some of the things that we've done in the past. But as as we've gotten older, we wind up doing just probably the, the Myrna Loy. If we could get, you know, sometimes we, we will go down to Butte and do a show. A couple of years ago, we went back to Polson, revisited mm. Polson, so. Right on.
so you've done a lot of these shows, Jim. How do you keep it fresh? How do you, how do you decide what, what songs stay on the set list? Who's the musical director? Well, I'm How the do you make it happen? I'm the musical director, but everybody chips in. It's a, it's a real collaboration. One of the things that I wanted to make sure did not happen is that it would be a rehash of the same old Christmas canon that we hear every year. And not to say that that's bad, you know, everybody likes to go to the Nutcracker every year because it's tradition, but I wanted to make this something unique so that when people came here and they listen, they're going, to, they're going to hear instruments that they have never heard before, and they're going to hear appropriate seasonal music that's old, ancient tones, as I mentioned before, that they haven't heard before. We have at least probably three to four songs that we do every, every year. One of them is a solon, and the reason why we do a solon is because that kind of enters into the history of the soul cakes, and we serve soul cakes at at uh, intermission, so. What's a soul cake? Soul cake is this shortbread cake that was made back in probably the 1500s. And on All Souls Day, children would go around and they would sing this song and they would sing for the souls of the dearly departed. And All Souls Day is after Halloween. and it's basically a precursor to trick or treat. And so they would sing for uh, whoever happened to pass away in this particular household. And in return, they would get this little treat, this little, little uh, biscuit. And so they would say, you know, please give me a soul cake and, and we'll sing for the persons that have that passed on, so. Who makes the soul cakes? Originally, I had the Sweetgrass Bakery make soul cakes, and they would make 300 plus. And, and that's part of the ticket price. When people come in, they get free food, so to speak. But uh, I've included the Helen High culinary class because they always are looking for opportunities. Joan Like, who is the, is the teacher there, is always looking for real opportunities for her kids to have real life experiences. And so they cater, they make, and they cater. And they make uh, close to 600 of them because we have two shows. We have one on a Wednesday and another on a Thursday. This is probably the only show in Helena that sells out two days in a row. Yeah, we're, uh, it, it has always sold out. Is that true out. or false? I That's, mean, no, it, no, it's, it's, a, it's amazing. It sold out from the very first year we did it. And generally it sells out about 10 days ahead of time. So, you know, people get their tickets early. What do they love about it? <laughs> I think they, they feel like it's a living room. You know, it's a living room concert. We're not professional musicians, but we're highly accomplished amateurs. You are, and yeah. And so there's, you know, it's not gonna be perfect. And yet we enjoy it so much. It's like a Christmas present to, our, to the community to get our friends. And so there's a, a lot of comedy. There's a lot of surprises. Uh, there are people that come up from the audience and join us on stage. There's dancers, there's, you know, poems, there's stories. There's a, a wide variety of things for people to tap into. But it's different this year. Most assuredly. You recorded here yesterday as we were talking. Right, um, recorded with, with Dublin Gulch and then uh, about oh, a month ago, a little over a month ago with Wilson McKee when they were here. Well, I think people are gonna have fun watching this Oh, we hope so. Home. I sent, sent in some archival footage from 2001, so we'll see how that turns out. We don't know if that's gonna be on or not. And if it is, all right. <laughs> You're gonna get to see me with hair. And, uh, and it was good hair too. And then, of course, we all look considerably younger. Oh, the holly, she bears a bear. He has a weight, has the limb. And Mary, she bore Jesus. And Mary, she bore Jesus, our Savior, for to be. And the first tree that's in the green wood, it was the Jesus, who died for us 
And Mary's for Jesus, our Savior, for to be. And the first tree that's in the green wood, it was the Wilson and McKee. Those of you at home, don't start saying McKee and McWilson. <laughs> that is the wrong way to do it. <laughs> Wilson and McKee. Ken, Kim, mm -hmm. really happy to have you here. How did you get involved in such an enterprise as a thing called the Celtic Cowboy Christmas? Well, we were living in Polson, and we met um, Mr. Jim Schultz, which everybody in the community knows, and he was part of the Dublin Gulch, had jumped in with them, and they had already been doing the show, and then he invited us one year, and it's it, we stuck like octopus, yeah, on your face. Yeah. 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 We just kept coming Ouch. back. <laughs> but uh, not live this year, or at least not live to a big audience, right? I know. It's yeah. going to be... We're, we're gonna, sad. We're, we're sad about it. that. How has the COVID treated your schedule. Um, what have you not done that you wanted to do? Uh, all of it. <laughs> all of it, yeah. Uh, part, of, part of the trouble was, you know, like all people in, in the entertainment business starting March 6th, everything was canceled. So you would think that would give you lots of time to stay home and practice and work on the recording you never finished and do all the things, all the home projects. And it did, but you also lose, we've also lost a little bit of incentive to, to really rehearse and work hard because we can't see something, the next thing that we need to be ready for. So actually getting ready for, for this taping is, is really good for us because it made us remember that that's why we do this because we love it so much. I've had a similar experience. I have uh, more dedicated musician friends who have taken real advantage of this time. Um, recording and uh, writing and for me, if I don't have something on the schedule, it's really it's hard. hard to, to self-motivate. It is hard to keep your motivation up. You just kind of go, well, even though, yeah, we could take advantage of it, but. Before this happened, what was your touring life like? What, what do you do? Well, for 30 years, we've mostly been involved in the arts market which means working with state and local arts councils through community concerts and artists in the schools, just thousands and thousands and thousands of schools and uh, educating, because part of our what our music is is about education. 
we were very, very busy. And over the last couple of years, we've pulled back quite a bit in our delicate age. We're semi-retired and not doing the big, huge, long two and three month tours like we used to. So we'd already been pulling back a little bit, um, but we did have our favorite tours that we kept going to. Um, and we're usually here in, Oct in August, um, in Montana in August to do a regular route yeah. of all the places we always play. And of course that didn't happen. And then again in December to do the Celtic Cowboy. So we were missing those mightily, but we have such dear friends that, you know, you come and, and be safe with them anyway, so. Kim, you're a songwriter. Occasionally. Well, are you compelled to write? Um, do you have to try to write? Where do your songs come from? Early on, it was all about um, traditional stories, stories from Ireland and Scotland, and I would either go there and visit and hear a story. Um, the, the really best ones were somebody else's story that I got to tell. And even my tunes have a basis in a landscape or a story that I heard, and I try to make that come to life through the music. Um, they always start, my songs always start with words. Melody comes second, which is interesting because oh. I've been an instrumentalist since I was five. So you'd think the melody would come first. But I always have a harder time going from melody to words than from words to melody. So if I have the poem and I have the idea and the story, then I can match that up with the melody yeah. somehow afterwards. But the best ones, and I, I, I really feel like the, the handful that I feel like were my best work were all at once. 
and oh. they just came all at once, and that doesn't happen very often. So those those are my my treasures because I didn't have to work so hard at them. They just the stories told themselves. You know, almost nobody does it that way. Most oh. people start with the music. Yeah, I I do. I mean, I'm well, not I'm a, a prolific writer, but yeah. I start with the yeah. um, music. Yeah. Right. There is a challenge to making the melody match the story, so that you're not telling this kind of a story, but the melody sounds like you're trying to tell a different story. So there is a challenge that way. But I just write, I, I'm a writer, I write all the time. So I've got volumes of things I've written. And um, so those words come a lot easier to me than the music. What else do you write? Uh, stuff. <laughs> 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 um, poems, I've tr I, I try to do a little stories for my grandkids. I write little kids stories once in a while, just for my family. Um, I do some poetry books that I give just to the family. So just, I, I have a strange brain that works with telling, yeah. Weird stories with the short poems. She's got stacks and stacks of <laughs> stories and poems and prose. And I have to say, it's all pretty darn good. And then some of it's great. Now, speaking of bragging about Kim, <laughs> um, tell me about one of her songs that you particularly like and what do you like about it? I have a, a lot of favorite songs of hers, but an interesting story is she wrote a song called The Pattern, which was all about the pattern knitted into a sweater so that a wife could, could identify or, or rescuers could identify someone pulled from the sea because the Irish Sea takes a lot of people. Okay, So she wrote this song about the pattern saying you could identify that person, oh, that's so-and-so from such-and-such such a township or family, and they could tell by the pattern in the sweater. So that was one of my favorites, and she submitted uh, that uh, a few years ago to the uh, Milwaukee Irish Fest Songwriting Contest, and she won first place with that song. Yeah, which was absolutely stunning because they loved the tragedy, and it was tragic. And she put two songs in that year, and the second song she put in took second place. Whoa. So she rocked it. That was, and those are both great songs, and to this day we still play them. Uh -huh. We're going to do a song called Five Round Moons. It has to do with the indigenous people counting time for, with, by the full moons and a small child who doesn't understand that the trees look dead, but they're really not.
So you mentioned involving the Helena High culinary class that Joan Light runs. Mm -hmm. What other community groups have been involved over the years? Local Irish dance, um, Irish dancers have been involved since day one. And it started off with the Kerrigan dancers and now it's the Tiernan dancers. And they're always looking for opportunities to showcase their talent. And of course they've got a lot of Irish jigs, reels, and slip jigs to dance to. And and that's part of it makes that type of music uh, much more enjoyable because that's what it is, it's dance music. In years past, we've had people come up and polka, we've had some Western swing dancers do some stuff. One of the other things that we do as far as the community is concerned, besides having local community musicians, is that we support the Helena Food Share. Where I work. Where you work, yeah. absolutely, John. And uh, rather than doing food, we'll provide some type of, uh, a prize. Last year it was mittens, handmade. We auctioned those off, and I think we made about six six hundred dollars for the Helena Food Share. So, and I know I know that's not your part of the wing there. <laughs> You're in charge of food, but you know there was a there was a check that came through. Oh, we appreciate it. Yeah. Do you do uh, rocking around the Christmas tree? No. Do you do 
I'll Have a Blue Christmas? No. If you came to the show, John, the only song that you would recognize is Silent Night. Oh. And we always sing that as the, as the parting song. Well, that's, that's a good one. Yeah. Tell me about how you pick the songs and, you know, what, what do you like? What, what do you like that you've picked for this year's show? I spent all year long diving into the deep, deep, deep well of seasonal songs for the, the winter season, season of snow. And I really focus on Scottish, Irish, old English, old Appalachian tunes. There is an abundance of great music out there that just has to be rediscovered. A lot of people no, the Seeger family has a huge collection of Christmas songs from Appalachia. I go into that and I start looking at their library and I pull out Gene Ritchie songs. I'll pull out Woody Guthrie songs. Tom Powers is a wealth of knowledge and he'll say, well, I know this one in particular. It's a great song called Christmas in Carrick. And there are thousands and thousands of tunes that just kind of have that ancient thread that goes back for centuries and centuries. And that's what we want to tap into because there's something in our DNA that holds true to that. And also, there's always new songs with that ancient flavor. Kim McKee is excellent at it. And you bring in the harp and everything sounds good on the harp. Can you tell me about one of the songs that you did this year that you haven't done before on one of these shows? Ah, that's great. We did a song that we haven't done since the very first show. It's called Bridget Flynn. And it's not really a Christmas song per se, but it is evocative of what it's like to be a bachelor in your living with your parents in the middle of winter in Ireland and longing for someone to be your sweetheart. There's some girl. There's some girl, Bridget, yeah, yeah, Bridget, there Bridget Flynn. Yeah. Bridget Flynn, and of course, she doesn't have an eye for me. Oh. And so it's unrequited love. But we haven't done that since the very first show, and since this is kind of like a retrospective, we picked some of the, the uh, songs that uh, people have liked and that we've liked from years past, and that was one of them. I've a nice little house, a cow or two at grass, a plant garden running by the door. I've a shelter for the hens, a stable for the ass. Now what could a man want more? I don't know, maybe so, but a bachelor is easy and he's free. Still I've lots to look after though I'm living all alone. Sure nobody's looking after me Now me father's often told me I should go and have a try To find a girl who owns a bit of land and I know the way he says it, he's got someone on his mind And my mother has the whole thing planned I don't know, maybe so But would mollify them greatly to agree Now there's little Bridget Finn, sure it's her I'd like to win But she never has an eye for me girl who is worth her weight in gold and that's a decent dowry don't you see and I mean to go and ask her just as soon as I get old if she'll come and have an eye for me will she go I don't know but I'd love to have her sitting on my knee and I'd sing like a thrush in a hawthorn bush if she 
come and have an eye for me Sure I'd sing like a thrush in a hawthorn bush If she'd come and have an eye This is a Scots song, and this particular version is seasonal somewhat. And I recently discovered that Razio, or Razzi, is a little town on an isle called the Isle of Butte, but it's B U T E, but we'll take it anyway. Well, one New Year's Eve in Glasgow town, when all we had was half a crown. A bunch of us thought we'd prowl around and find some fun in Razio. We wandered out Victoria Street. We didn't care much for snow nor sleet. And at half past two with aching feet, we found ourselves in Razio. Didn't we do a dumb a day? Didn't we do a daramo? Didn't we do a dumb a day the night we went to Razio? Michael Kavanaugh here, he's a bit of a lout Said he'd treat us all to a pint of stout So as quick as we could we all set out For a public house in Razio Says I, my lads, I'd like to sing But says he'll nay do such a thing I said clear the room and we'll make a ring And I'll fight ye all in Razio Didn't we do a dumb a day, didn't we do a dad well, we had to find a place to sleep We were all too drunk to even creep And we found a place that was really cheap In a boarding house in Razio We all lay down to take our ease And somebody happened for to sneeze and awake and half a million fleas in a single room in Razio. Did him a do a dumb a day, did him a do a dumb Did him a do a dumb a day, the night we went to Razio. There were several different kinds of pests. And they ran and they jumped inside our vests. And they got in our hair and they built their nest. And they cried, hurrah for Razio. Says I, I think we'll head for home. And we swore we never more would roam And we're scratching still as we sing the poem of the night we went to Razio Didn't we do a dumb a day, didn't we do a daramo Didn't we do a dumb a day, the night we went to Razio Didn't we do a dumb a day, didn't we do a daramo Didn't we do a dumb a day, the night we went to Razio So one of the things we like to do here on the sound stage is talk about weird instruments. <laughs> and Kim is going to talk to me about whatever it is she is holding right there. What do you have there, Kim? Uh, traditionally, this would be called most commonly a mountain dulcimer, also sometimes called a lap dulcimer mm -hmm. or a fretted dulcimer. And the reason that has so many names is it came from the Appalachian Mountains. The mountain folk invented these. Um, but there's also a hammer dulcimer, which is a percussion instrument, and I play that as well. It's a big yes. old thing like this. Yes. Completely different. Completely different family. That's a percussion instrument, um, and I play that as well. I didn't bring one on this trip, so um, this is what we're involving with the Celtic Cowboy Show this year. They're just very simple folk instruments, um, only four strings and one scale, and all diatonic, and it's pretty easy. B built by people who couldn't read or write and played by people who couldn't read or write. So it's in a particular, it's tuned to a particular key? Uh, yeah, well, and you have several tunings, you have modal tuning, so if you wanna play in a different key, you have to retune everything, which is a little unhandy. <laughs> um, and mine right now, I, I predominantly play in the mixolydian scales because it gives me a full scale across all the strings. Um, as opposed to the traditional way of playing where you only play on one string and the other two drone. 
Right, that's how I learned it. I mean, to the extent that I learned it, like playing Wildwood Flower or there whatever. But traditionally, you would just play the two strings that are tuned the same. Correct. Up and, on the high end, and the others are yep. tuned to a drone. Correct. And actually, the original tunings would be uh, the drone strings are actually tuned to the same drone pitch as the bagpipes. So if you were playing bagpipes, you have the chanter and then your drone sound, and mm -hmm. that's these are set up to, to mimic that sound originally, mm -hmm. um, the original version. And they would have only had three strings. You had one treble string. Uh, okay. Later, they doubled those to get a little bit more volume out of your, out of your melody. Out of the melody, right? Right, right. And so, but you don't play it that way. You play it in a different way. I tell do. Us, tell I us do. about how you how you play it. Traditionally, they would have had a quill, a turkey, or a goose quill, and you would strum across. That's your plectrum, and you play only that. As you mentioned, the treble string. That would be a traditional way to play it. When I got my hold, the feather. hold my feather. <laughs> When I got my first dulcimer, I didn't even know what it was called, and I had no idea how to play it, and I was isolated, so I just found my own way to play it. I do a lot of um, finger picking, but mostly I use tapping, a tapping technique, which is more of a guitar thing. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, it would be, I can do something without my right hand at all. So basically, Kim uh, taught Eddie Van Halen how to play the guitar. <laughs> well, I had no idea it was a guitar technique until the guitar player said, oh, we do that. We call those hammer-ons and pull-offs on the uh, guitar. And I'm, oh, cool. Kim uh, plays more than one weird instrument. And so let's introduce ourselves to another one. We all know that a harp is an instrument that angels play in heaven. Um, and also, Kim McKee plays one right here on the Myrna soundstage. Kim, tell me about this instrument. This is a Scottish harp uh, built by a man from Scotland who's quite famous in the harp world, the folk harp world. It is a folk harp. The difference in is mainly between the classical or the big pedal harps that are huge and giant and worth more than my house. These were these are smaller, so supposedly a little more trans, transportable. Not so much. This one's pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. um, but the traditional harps from Ireland and Scotland would have been lap harps, very small, so that the bards could carry them from place to place. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a medium size, um, and it is considered a folk harp because I have levers and not pedals. Mine is gut strung. Traditional Scottish harps are strung with, um, with traditional gut strings, and then Irish harps traditionally were strung with wire, brass wire. And those uh, players used their fingernails to play, so quite a difference there. Whose guts? What whoever was handy. So <laughs> no, they're, they're, they're sheep intestines. Um, yeah, we love to gross kids out in schools with that. Uh -huh. That the sheep, we borrow the sheep, not till they were finished with them, and then we borrow the intestines and, and then make them into strings. So what are all the colors of the strings? The colors help your eyes to see where your fingers are going. Now, traditionally in Ireland, many of the harp players were blind men. They were all men. It was a man's profession till the 1700s. So the men were, if they lost their eyesight, they couldn't do farm work or other types of work. They would learn to play the harp. You can play it by feel, and they would become bards and travel. I, however, am very visual. I need to see. Uh, and the gut strings are all very transparent. You'd have a really hard time knowing the difference in lengths um, immediately. So the red ones are C notes, and the black ones are F notes. And it just helps me place my fingers within the scale. This is a Scottish harp, so it's tuned to E flat. So right now I am in the key of C and I can go from red note to red note in the key of C. If I want to play in the key of G, I have to shorten the string or by a half a step on the F notes to make a, a G scale. So what the levers do is gives me the black notes of the piano. Uh huh. But you have to flip them, so they're not really conducive to classical or jazz, because you'd have to do a lot of that, uh -huh. as opposed to just playing straight through. So traditional music that stays in one key all the way, it's fine. Yeah.
yesterday you recorded here, and I was not here for that recording. And so I just want to ask you, what was your favorite musical part of your recording session yesterday? I think my favorite musical part of the recording session yesterday was when Lenny was setting up all of the cameras and getting the, the lighting um, button down is that we just sat and we just stood and sang a bunch of sea shanties. Everybody knows a sea shanty or two, but not everybody else knows that's part of the sea shanty, but it's easy because it's just, it's like a Baptist sermon. It's just, you repeat oh. whatever the minister says. And so, call and response. Call and thing. response. So yeah. we wound up doing that and we had a great time. And then after that, we did our, you know, we did our- The real our, show. The real show, yeah. yeah. But of those, I think the one that I enjoyed the most was an old blue gla bluegrass standard called uh, Christmas Times Are Coming. All right. That's the cowboy part of the show. Well, it's been a joy uh, talking to you, Jim Schultz. Same here, about John. About Dublin Gulch it's... and about the Celtic Cowboy Christmas. And I do um, have a present for you. Um, <laughs> I noticed that you didn't wear your Christmas best. Oh, man. Um, so. I do have this present for you. I do expect you to wear it. <clears throat> and it just fits. It actually fits. I mean, I can put it on right now. Yeah, you should put it on. Okay. Because it's cold in here. Yeah. Oh, man. John, do I get to keep this? Um, sure. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh-huh. We've left the tags on to this point, so we can take it back to Target, but you can have it. John, I appreciate this. This, is, this has touched me deeply. Thanks for spending some time with us. I'm here with uh, Jim Schultz of Dublin Gulch, happy to talk about the Celtic Cowboy Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. One, two, three. Christmas time's a coming, Christmas time's a coming, Christmas time's a coming, and I know I'm going home. Snowflakes are falling. Christmas time.